Good afternoon, this is Inside UNC Charlotte. I'm Will City. Named for the African forest where it was first isolated in the 1940s, the Zika virus has assumed a greatly elevated public profile over the past year. An ongoing outbreak in Brazil is estimated to have infected more than one and a half million people and has been associated with debilitating birth defects and other serious health concerns. As the eyes of the world turn to Rio de Janeiro in the 2016 Summer Olympics, scientists and public health officials across the globe are moving quickly to respond to the virus, which many experts believe will spread across the Americas in the coming months. Dr. Dan Janis, the Carol Grotness Belk Distinguished Professor of Bioinformatics and Genomics at UNC Charlotte, is among those responding. He joins me in studio today to explain how. Dr. Janis, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. So Zika is known generally as a relatively mild virus. What's different in this case that has public health officials concerned and scientists involved? Well, the disease has recently spread from Africa across Asia and the Pacific, and in doing so, it's taken on new properties. It's caused birth defects in um, children, and it's caused Guillain-Barre syndrome in some um, mature adults. So could you go a bit further into those two conditions and why they're worrisome? Well, our work has shown that the virus has picked up novel mutations as it crossed the Pacific into the Americas, and those mutations seem to be allowing it to attack the immune system, uh, both causing the birth defects and Guillain-Barre syndrome, and that's completely new for the virus. And both of those conditions can cause long-term debilitating uh, conditions or in some cases even death. Yeah, in the children it's microcephaly, and then we're finding out more every day, it might not just be microcephaly. There's ocular and limb problems as well. And in mature adults, uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome is a paralytic disease. And if it's not treated, it can attack the lungs and then cause death. And specifically, microcephaly is when the child's head and brain don't fully develop? That's correct. And that's one very obvious uh, phenotype of the disease. But there's many others, uh, the limb problems, the eye problems, the hearing problems and the developmental problems. So I think the average person is probably familiar with how an epidemiologist studies disease and its spread, but what does someone who's in genomics and bioinformatics do when they take a look at a disease or a virus like Zika? Well, epidemiology is typically looking at the occurrence of the disease, putting points on a map. With genomics, we're allowed to look at the biology of the disease itself, its genetics and look at what's changed to actually cause the disease in a more functional molecular way, and also by genetic similarity, connect those dots and see how the disease is moving across the earth. So you're looking at both time and geography, and you're comparing samples that have been taken from patients across time and geography? That's correct. Um, labs across the world are sequencing the virus and sharing that information over the internet. We compare all those viruses and compare their um, metadata, where they're taken from and what biological properties they have, what animals or humans they're taken from, and we put all that in context akin to a weather map. How dependent is this kind of science on the technological advancements of the last 15 or 20 years? It seems that both in sharing the data and in processing it, that that would be very important. Yeah, it's bioinformatics and genomics in our program is a reflection of a lot of very recent technological advances. One, the ability to share information rapidly over the internet primarily. Two, the ability to rapidly compute uh, on that shared information. These are big data problems and we have uh, high performance computers to do that. And three, the advent of uh, very good sequencing technology so we can observe with precision um, uh, the building blocks of the viruses. So with all that technology, what have you been able to find with Zika specifically, and, and if you could show us that through this computer animation that you brought with you today? Great. So on the surface of the Earth, we'll have all the points of occurrence of Zika, and where you see white lines, those are Zika isolates that are closely related to each other, sisters, okay? And so here's uh, the origins of Zika in uh, East Africa in the 1947 time frame. Then going forward, it's moved into uh, West Africa and Central Africa, but it's also made the jump to Asia. And these are just the sequence isolates. Some of our work um, shows, and some of the work of others, shows that there may be a much more deep Eurasian ancestry of this virus, and that's something to be looking out for. There might be other outbreaks um, in Central Asia. Um, going forward in time, 
here in the basically 07, 08 timeframe, the virus moved to Micronesia, still not yet causing the severe birth defects though, but uh, you know, a number of cases in Micronesia. And then in the 2013 timeframe, moving across the Pacific, South Pacific, this is French Polynesia, for example, and then in the 2015, 2016 timeframe, what we're all familiar with, the virus moving into the Americas, and in doing so, gaining these mutations that cause the severe illnesses. Right, so something changed between the cases uh, in, in Polynesia and then when it moved to the Americas. Will your research help illuminate what that change was? Yes, we're looking at a number of factors, but one of them is uh, the envelope protein of the virus, the part that interacts with the host cell, seems to have changed to be much better at infecting um, neurological uh, cells in, in humans, and that may be causing the Guillain-Barre and the um, birth defects. We're also looking at other aspects of the virus um, that allow it to adapt to human host cells as well. And these changes aren't purposeful uh, from the virus's perspective, as you've explained in the past, but what's happening? Why is the virus doing this? Well, as the virus, viruses replicate themselves, they make a lot of errors. They don't have a lot of error correction in their replication, and that's actually an advantage. Their sloppiness is an advantage, and some of those um, variants go on to take on new properties and allow the virus to have new strategies, such as crossing the Pacific, not on mosquitoes, but on uh, human travelers. So what are the next steps moving forward for you and your lab, and what are some of the concerns you're looking at from, a, from an American, from a North American perspective in terms of the spread of this virus? Yeah, well just, um, you know, this past two weeks we've had this outbreak in Miami, so we, in, it is an, a, a continental U.S. problem, and it looks like these outbreaks are not travel-oriented, that people who have not traveled in Miami are, are starting to experience the disease from their local mosquitoes. What we're looking towards now is which species of mosquitoes can be infected and what's the range of those mosquitoes across the continental United States. And that will allow us to predict the spread of the virus. So as an urban research university, of course the research is important, but we'll also look at the student experience and educating students. How does this work uh, relate to what your students are doing and what the bioinformatics program is doing? Well, we built a department which is unique in the country and in the world around these technologies and training uh, uh, masters and PhD students and undergraduates in these technologies. And what they're doing is doing very socially relevant work using technology and they're getting out with great jobs. Well, I think that's about all the time we have today. Dr. Janice, thank you so much uh, for joining us and we'll keep up with your research as we continue to monitor the spread of Zika. Thanks very much. And for more content, check out our YouTube channel or uncc.edu.